Hello everybody and welcome to a new video. Victor here from the Gembox training team and today we are going to perform some analysis of trend following trading systems. So today's contents are the following. I'll recap from the previous video. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, trends, seasonality and noise in, the, in a time series. Uh, we are also going to talk about oscillators, uh, the market efficiency theory, the signal to noise ratio, some short term trading systems based on momentum and investing portfolios using dual momentum. So to make a recap, uh, in the previous video we have talked about a quantitative analysis of time series. And if you all remember, when we decompose a time series, we have three components. So we have the observed component, a component that means the whole time series. And if we perform a decomposition, we can see the trend component. That means the growth of a time series on the long term, the seasonal component that means uh, predictable and variable predi prediction in a time span of less than a year and the noise slash residual slash random component. That means uh, a part of the time series that we cannot predict. In this case, we are going to talk today about uh, the trend and noise components. So we are going to use oscillators. <coughs> We can defi define oscillators applied to trading as any indicator, any technical analysis indicator that creates periodic or semi-periodic changes over time. Usually these changes will be based on the return of a certain asset or its deviation to the mean. So what are they for? All right, so the first use, uh, the use that we all know is to indicate the current trend. This means uh, the RSI of 14 periods is uh, below 50. So yeah, we have a bullish trend and it's, if it's uh, instead of above, sorry, below uh, 50, we have a bearish trend, but they also serve us or they are, are great for measure of return over time and to study pullbacks and divergences. So how can we extract with a certain precision the trend component with an oscillator? All right, this is a simple question with a more complicated than you can imagine <laughs> answer. So we are going to look for an autocorrelation, meaning this that uh, we want to check if the previous returns have any positive or negative effect uh, or correlation in future prices. If you all uh, recall the last video we made uh, before this one, uh, we talk about uh, integration on time series to create trend following trend systems and spreads. In this case, this is uh, similar but we are going to have some nuances in the, uh, at the hour or time that we are using this kind of indicator. So if the return begins or starts to be negative or positive, what is going to happen with the price? So uh, we can extract uh, returns. In this case, we are going to talk about the momentum indicator. So we are going to stick with this. We can extract uh, the year to date performance or year um, yeah year to date or the last uh, year uh, returns to check the strength or weakness of an asset we can also check that strength using periods how well this an asset has been performed over the last uh, 14 trading days um, we can uh, use a um, relative comparison between assets to know if an asset is outperforming or underperforming the market. Uh, in this uh, table, we have some stock mutual funds. Uh, we can see its performance, that means the re annual return or the three and five year return, 
and its benchmark. In this case, uh, mutual funds doesn't outperform the benchmark. In this case, they are underperforming it. So we can see that in the benchmark, we have a 16% of return and in the large cap funds, we only have barely a 15% of return. As you can see, there is a difference here that is going to allow us to create some interesting trading systems. Also, we can talk about pullbacks and divergences, short-term versus long-term trends. What does the return indicate us and what does the price indicate price indicates us? All right, so when we are talking about a pullback, we are talking about a retracement on the short-term trends. But we want, in this case, a pretty fine long-term trend. Uh, we have already talked about that in the Gmbox trading channel in our first video, if I recall it correctly, about uh, swing tra trading with a stock indexes. Uh, but anyway, in this case, for example, let's say that we have a um, bullish trend uh, over time uh, for, I don't know, 10 years, and we have a small correction in the last two days. That's what we are going to call a pullback. We are going to buy the dip. And when we are talking about divergences, uh, a divergence is a mix of the use the, of the current signal of an indicator and the previous one. Let's say that uh, the previous signal was a buy signal and the price was $2. And the current signal is a uh, Another buying signal and our indicator, in fact, a uh, signal that has uh, more strength, but uh, the current price instead of being two dollars is one US dollar. So, more, uh, this signal, the blue signal, can be a failed one or not, but usually it's going to be a failed one. So, we're going to talk a little bit about a uh, data representation to see what are we going to do today. So we have a normalized data and non-normalized data. What kind of data represents best the financial markets? Let's find out. So uh, we have in this chart, uh, in this slide, the temperature of a certain American city expressed in Fahrenheit degrees. And we can see some anomalies in this data. So we can uh, see that even if the scale is going from zero to a hundred, this data is not normalized. So uh, we have a, a certain number of anomalies. In this case, we can see that uh, the temperature drop uh, to zero Fahrenheit. And uh, this is going to be a huge advantage and a huge problem. Why? All right, let's see. First of all, we have normalized oscillators, normalized data, such as the stochastic relative strength index and Williams percent range, along with some others. So they have a uh, default values. They always are going to oscillate between zero and hundred or zero and one or minus one to one usually, but they cannot succeed the its own limits. That means if the previous value of the RSI was 100 and the prices keep rising up, we are going to still have a 100 value. This means, in this case, even if we have some anomalies, uh, the, uh, the data won't show them. So they indicate a maximum and minimum force or strength in the markets. This doesn't happen with non-normalized oscillators like Momentum, MACD, and the Commodity Channel Index. They don't have any maximums or minimums. They have, or they may have some relevant values like a crossover of the zero value, or if we are talking about the CCI, a crossover of the 300 value, but they are going to oscillate freely meaning that any anomaly that we can see on the market is going to be reflected on this indicator, right? <clears throat> so, uh, 
So now we would know how uh, indicators work, how we can represent the data, uh, and a little bit about strength and randomness. So I guess that it's time to talk about the uh, efficiency theory on financial markets. So the efficient market theory implies that all information, all current information has already been discounted in the price. So if we are looking to create a trend following trading system, what that data is going to be influencing the market or even better say, is this theory true? Uh, all the prices in the market are the same at its own value for the day. All right, so for those, uh, those who doesn't know market participants, uh, let's state something like this. Does an investor, an algorithmic trading and a hedging farmer uh, have the same data or use the same data? Yes, they have the same data, but the users is going to differ. An investor may use microeconomic data or the SEC feelings, an algorithmic trader is going to use uh, mostly price and volume data in order to create models to trade the market, and a hedging farmer is just probably to uh, make out research about uh, new technologies and crops and other countries and a weather forecast. So this impacts on how do we per perceive the current information. The problem with the market efficiency theory is that it states or assumes that everyone is doing the same. That means if I just open a Tesla stock chart and my neighbor opens it to you, we both are going to be thinking the same. We are go both going to buy or sell the asset because we all have the same data and that's let's say that that's a wrong theory assuming that anyone can uh, trade the same so is this theory effective no a huge no a very serious no trend or auto correlation process will be a uh, a divergence between the price uh, we are receiving, we are uh, getting, and the, with an underlying uh, value, or even we can say in some kind of assets, uh, it's a margin of safety, for example, if we are talking about a main investing asset, but uh, in this case, sometimes the market will be efficient and sometimes not. Following the trend, implies following market expectations. Uh, we are going to create models and we are going to study models uh, where we can uh, have a slight edge on the market given these facts. So uh, why sometimes the market is effective and why sometimes the market doesn't? So we already had uh, randomness on a time series is and how it's even produced, but how can we study randomness? How? All right, so we are going to use the signal noise ratio. In this case, the signal noise ratio calculation is the following. The absolute return of a certain period divided the absolute return or the absolute value, excuse me, of the cumulative sum of the return of each candlestick in that period. This means uh, the return of a period may be the close one divided close 14 and the cum cumulative sum of the each candlestick returns is going to be close one divided open one plus close two divided open two up to 14. So this way we want to check where each candlestick is giving us relevant information because it's performing the same movement as the overall trend or the current trend and when the market is just moving sideways. In this case, uh, we can perceive that, uh, first of all, noise is oscillating and second, moments with high noise, most cases are going to be a sideways movement. 
move yeah we are going to have some moments with trends and some moments without a trend so are there some patterns in the noise let's see what happens when the ratio is low and when the ratio is high if the ratio is below 0 20 will be the we are going to be receiving or receiving a low signal related to the market noise and if our ratio is above 0 80 everything or almost everything will be a signal on the market so my first ideas about this ratio euro usd a uh, period of four hours let's see what can we extract here uh, let me make a statement here i'm using the previous uh, signal value and extracting the current value so um, i want to check out uh, in this case when the market uh, it, excuse me i'm confusing I'm, I'm making a confusing statement uh, we want to check out if we have a uh, more signal than noise if it is going to continue for the next period and in this case we can find here something interesting first of all the vast majority of the market movements are merely noise and uh, we can see that in the chart on the right uh, we have a lot more of samples but uh, most of the samples are just sideways movements and some spikes. The trend movements are not going to last. And when they are going to last, we can move to the left chart and we can see that when the noise ratio is higher than itself, meaning that this value is a normalized data, we can see some trend following movements up to 800 pips and, or ticks and yeah that's that's pretty interesting where we are creating trading systems so what notes uh, can we get from this indicator first of all and this is very important let me state this uh, this is not vital but almost when we are trading uh, using large periods we are going to find that the amount of noise is very high because the trend is not uh, regular this means uh, we are trading a non-stationary time series uh, meaning its mean and variance is going to change along the time so if i use a large period of calculation we are i'm going to get a mean of ratios about 0.25 and with a small calculation period, such as the one shown in the picture, previous picture, we can find higher quality signals. But please don't be confused. If we are going to use small time frames, doesn't matter if we are going to use a big or small pe calculation periods. Why? Because uh, the smaller the time frame, the higher is the amount of noise. While uh, we can see in five minutes candlesticks an average of uh, or a mean on this indicator of 0 to 20 we are going to see that in four hour periods we are going to have a mean of 0 40 or 0 50 so don't get confused between points one and two uh, large periods in the calculation is bad but also small time frames and there is some kind of duality when everyone is starting trading uh, they often tend to or try to be very long-term traders doing a uh, position trading instead of swing trading or very short-term focused traders why i don't know why what happens uh, in this duality but uh, all of these new traders that wants to be a scalpers on the market that wants to do day trading with a one minute chart uh, they are going to end badly first of all they don't have experience and second the amount of noise in the market it's incredible by the way we can check that the noise oscillates this there are moments that are completely random and moments where we have a huge signals from the market. So we are going to study trend following trading systems today. 
We are going to separate the concepts of long-term and short-term trading. We are going to see a uh, trading and investments today, but so we know that the noise is taking the reins of the market in the short term. What does this mean? So we are going to use the momentum indicator to solve this question. Possibly one of the best indicators to mark or define a trend of one or more assets. Uh, more of that later, but with a formula simple as actual return divided the return of a certain period, we can extract the percent return of the market for a certain period. As you can see, it's very simple formula in, for this indicator. We don't have normalized data and it's going to help us to measure the strength of an asset and to even compare it, being that in periods or dual momentum. So within the short term, the last value does not have to tell us everything. And this contradicts the mark of theory about the uh, current value is the one that is going to define the uh, future value. And yeah, the mark of theory is right, but uh, when we are talking about noise in the market, we want also to check current trends instead of integrating a same series of order one with a momentum indicator, we are uh, measuring at integrated series, for example, of order 14. So, first idea is what return do we have in next periods? What if we have a crossover from positive to negative? So, we are going to test a basic momentum system. So, uh, we are going to find a positive crossover, meaning that prices grows from negative to positive with an optimization period and when that happens I'm going to be buying to the market. Crossover over 100 if you're using MetaTrader, crossover, crossover over zero if you are using TradeStation. 36 periods, daily candles uh, or candlesticks and buy only. DAX 30 uh, with a profit factor of almost two or something a little bit higher than two we can see here that using the let's say previous strength or yeah in the long term trend and trying to look for a pullback uh, we can see here some interesting systems but the problem that we are going to face using a single momentum is during huge or wide volatility in the market. When a every term reaches zero, the current trend, the volatile trend, will have already self served its purpose with no time to re enter the market. So let's see what, what can happen or what happens. When we are comparing two periods of the momentum indicator, we have here a chart. So uh, in red we have the short term momentum and in black we have the high or long term momentum or higher period. In this case, 21 days is not a, it's not a long term period, but hey, you can make yourself some here is some idea about what I'm talking about. So this is a crossover and a filter edge for the Australian dollar, US dollar, uh, Forex currency or Forex pair. Uh, we can see here that we have uh, more than 1,300 trades. That's a great number. We have a slight edge in the market, but we are going to need to filter this in order to convert this into a trading system but as we can see something as simple of two periods of a, a momentum indicator we can create something interesting in order to trade the market and now that we know how to trade we are going to learn how to invest so we already know a part of the trading field with this indicator but what if we extrapolate it to long-term investment? Yeah, you know, uh, it's not only Forex, the whole market. Uh, even if you are trading with a MetaTrader 4 platform, 
uh, you have uh, stock indexes, uh, low commodities or just commodities like oil, natural gas, uh, gold, silver, and even you are going to find some stocks. So what can we do with this? Let's find out. Dual momentum strategies. So far, we have only compared the return of an asset against the same assets in different periods. But what happens if we check the return of several assets? We are going to trade the market as a whole, or even better said, say the market, we are going to treat it as a set. So what is your momentum trading strategies or investing strategies and why are they great in order to create an investing portfolio that beats the market? We know the whole drill, the whole premises about autocorrelation, time series quantitative analysis. And the first conclusion that we can extract for that is the returns are often correlated, especially when there is fear in the market. So we are going to compute uh, the momentum signal uh, for the standard Bulls 500, global small stocks and long term treasuries. And we are going to begin our, let's say our chart, our flow chart. We have the signals. All right. Is the standard Bulls 500 signal greater than the small global stocks one? Yeah, it is. Is the standard Bulls 500 signal greater than zero? That means we have a positive return. Yeah, it is. So, all right, let's go by the standard Bulls 500. If the signal is below zero, then we are going to buy long term three series. If the standard Bulls 500 signal is lesser, smaller than the small global stock signal, we are going to check. Is at least the global small stock signal greater than zero? Yeah, all right. Go buy sm global small stocks. And if not, we are going to keep buying long-term treasuries. In this case, we are going to buy the strength in the market. We are going to buy uh, the asset that is going, uh, that is growing faster, but only if we don't have uh, perceived risks on the market. If we have perceived risk, because even if the standard Bulls 500 return is better than the small uh, stocks or small global stocks uh, index, if both are below zero in on its return, then it's not worth it. In this case, uh, I don't want to buy the dip. I want to buy the strength to try to outperform the index. So. Given the fact that we are going to do this with contracts for difference, what insights can we extract from here? So we are going to check the relative index or the relative strength between some indexes and we are going to see if we can buy the strongest or the weakest, what is better. And if we can alternate uh, in indices or indexes with other assets. So, my rules for a dual momentum investing system. We are going to extract the return or momentum of various assets. Even if the world is dual as dual momentum, we can work with three, four, five, uh, up to the number of assets that you want, as long as your model works and it's not overfit. It's up to you. So I'm going to strike the momentum of one, two, and three months. And if one of the assets extend its counterpart outperforms its outer part for three months, I'm going to buy it. If none of the assets exceed or outperform the rest for three months, I'm going to stay on liquidity. So in this case, I have made myself an indicator here, as we can see sometimes we have our three months outperforming, um, sometimes not. In this case, uh, three or minus three, I don't care about the rest. So between the DAX 30 and Standard Poor's 500, or how to beat the European markets. This is the return of a thousand US dollars from 1999. 
up to the Copland Day. We are in, by the way in October 2020. So as we can see, yeah, we have some weakness in the final time of our portfolio. But when the market is going up, when the market is strong, we can see that uh, we are going to outperform it by far and we are going to have a less volatile behavior in financial crisis. Same applies if we compare to uh, stock indexes from the same, in this case, region of Europe. Have the DEX 30 and the CAC 40, Germany and France. And using the CAC 40, even if it's not the sharpest tool in the set when we are talking about indexes, this case is not the most bullish one, we can avoid uh, some confusing moments. So we can avoid financial crisis and we can try to outperform the market. And is it a good idea to buy a strength or to buy a fortress? So far, we have seen the uh, what happens if we buy the most bullish asset. Let's see what happens if we buy the weakest. In orange, we have the total return of the standard board's 500 and in blue, our portfolio. In this case, if the gold is, uh, has been the weakest asset for three months and buying gold and if it, that happened for the standard plus 500 i will be buying that index as we can see buying weakness is not always the smartest idea that we can do in terms of investing maybe in terms of spreading of ratios yeah that can be great but if we are talking about investing Probably you are going to need to study uh, why weak, uh, weakness is not a great right idea. By the way, some notes. Uh, it's interesting to use momentum systems to trade, yada, yada, yada. But when we are investing, uh, we need to take advantage or avoid the opportunity cost since we are not using leverage. It's important to have open positions into the market and not stay in liquidity. Meaning, if I don't have anywhere where I can put my money, just yes, buy long-term treasuries. And it's not usually worth looking for weakness. In any case, I don't want another Enron, Lehman Brothers, or Wildcard. No, I'm going to buy the uh, str strongest asset uh, like an index and a stock index does. Remember that a stock index calculation is basically we are going to add the strongest companies in terms of capitalization and when one company doesn't have the required capitalization because it has been surpassed by other, goodbye company. So uh, we need to create some models to measure strength in the long term and finally I hope you enjoyed this seminar. If you do, please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.